Welcome to the recorded version of Solving Communication Issues Within Families, part of the Family Caregiver Support Webinar Series, brought to you by the American Society on Aging and a generous sponsorship from Home Instead Senior Care. All right, our presenter today is going to be Lakeland Hogan. Lakeland is a strategic partnership representative with Home Instead Senior Care, and she's currently working toward a Master of Arts in Social Gerontology. Lakeland's passion for helping others has led her work with aging adults and their families as they navigate the senior care continuum. And with that, I would like to turn the floor and the presentation over to Lakeland Hoagland. Thanks for being here, Lakeland. Thanks for having me. Hello, everyone. Happy New Year. I hope your day is off to a great start. I want to start by thanking you so much for joining me today. And we're going to talk about a topic that's always challenging in our line of work, and that is family dynamics. And I'm going to uh, focus more specifically on sibling dynamics in those families that have multiple siblings involved in the care. And I know for a fact that many of you often find yourself in the middle of these often complicated relationships, and I myself have been in the same boat. So this topic will hopefully give you some tips on how to help families and siblings uh, stay out of the middle uh, and how for us as professionals stay out of the middle. So let's look more specifically at the topics here on our next slide. We'll start off with some hot buttons or red flags so that you can avoid or you can be prepared for some of these issues when they come up. Uh, we'll also get some tips today and even some checklists to help siblings through this caregiving journey. And as always, we'll discuss some resources that can help siblings overcome and even avoid some of these issues. So on the next slide here, we'll look at some of the reasons why sibling conflicts exist in caregiving situations. Um, and as we go through the webinar today, I ask that you think about your own family and your own siblings. Uh, think about how the caregiving situation would impact those relationships in your life. I know I'm the oldest of four siblings, and we're all together over the holidays, so I thought a lot about this sibling dynamic topic as I was preparing for the webinar with my own family. Um, but if you don't have siblings, maybe think of an example, maybe a family that you've already worked with in your professional setting, because um, I just would... I would like you to have a visual uh, when we're talking about things today. I think it will be helpful. Um, so let's get started. We all know that sharing uh, isn't easy for brothers and sisters, and many of you may remember back to when uh, you were growing up and there were always challenges of giving up toys, maybe bed sharing bedrooms or sharing a family car, maybe even sharing household chores household chores, and that might have led to some family conflict. And, you know, things never change even as we age. Um, and according to some research conducted by the Home Instead Senior Care Network, sharing the care of elderly parents can be a source of conflict for uh, adult siblings. And the research we found uh, that 43% of American families uh, have one sibling that is responsible for providing the majority of the care, and only about 2% of families split the caregiving responsibilities among siblings. And I don't know about you, but I thought this was kind of a startling statistic. Only 2% of families are sharing these responsibilities. So I think this is a timely topic. There's some definite opportunity for conflict there. Um, and I know people's lives get really busy and staying in touch is difficult, uh, even if with siblings who live in the same community. Um, but having some regular communication between siblings um, can prevent miscommunication and hurt feelings. Um, and it's really important for these families to have candid discussions about what's happening with their aging parents, and we'll dive a little deeper into that later. Um, but I wanted to quote an expert uh, Dr. Ingrid Candesis, uh, she's a siblings relationship expert from the University of Win uh, Western Ontario, and she says, caregiving can either bring families together or cause trouble, and in some cases it can do both. These issues can be very emotional, and I'm sure in your own uh, professional and maybe even personal life you've seen this. Uh, caring for a loved one is not easy. It can bring people together and also cause some conflict. So let's look at a few additional statistics here on this next slide. I thought this, uh, this slide shows some uh, interesting results that gives us some insight into issues that siblings face as they try to provide the best care for their aging parent. Uh, and this research can give you more insight into the issues that your senior clients may face in addition to their adult children. Uh, the results from a survey are listed here, and I wanted to give you some background on this survey. Uh, we surveyed about 710 adults in the U.S and about 380 adults in Canada, and these participants ranged in age from 35 to 64. And it, the, this research was conducted for the Home Instead Senior Care Network 
by the Boomer Project, which is America's leading authority for information and insight about today's boomer consumer and the fastest growing 50 plus age market. And these respondents either had siblings or step siblings and currently provide care for an aging parent or adult relative uh, or have provided care in the past 18 months. So uh, now that you have a little background, I'll get to some of the results here. So the survey shows that 46% of caregivers say that their sibling relationships have deteriorated and their brothers or sisters are unwilling to help in the caregiver uh, setting. And then we found 42% of families give themselves and their siblings a below average grade for their ability to divide the caregiving workload. So if we think about that for a minute, both the caregiver that's doing the majority of the work and the caregivers that aren't are saying they really don't know how to divide the work and they don't do it efficiently. And uh, this made me think of my own grandma. She has six children and she's currently living with her oldest daughter. She just turned 80, so we had a big celebration last month and we're we're really lucky she's still in very good health. She doesn't need much assistance at this point, but I began to notice that my aunts and uncles, they've all taken on different roles in her care. Um, she lives with my oldest, or her, the oldest aunt, um, and she checks in on her daily and makes sure that the other kids in the family are updated. She also accompanies her to health care appointments and such. Um, and then her sons have started to take her out to lunch and make sure she's socializing regularly. And they also pitch in with her financial um, situation, her living expenses. So I know as she continues to age, these siblings will need to adjust their roles as my grandma's uh, needs begin to grow, but this is kind of an example of how families can divide the workload, uh, especially when there's multiple siblings involved. And again, we'll dive deeper into this later, but I know these situations are always challenging, um, so I can see where these statistics are coming from. And I think it's interesting when it comes to birth order and how that affects uh, who's a primary caregiver and who's not. So the following statistics on the slide state that uh, 40, or sorry, 64 percent of youngest siblings are the primary caregiver compared with 57 percent of the oldest siblings and 49 percent of middle siblings are the primary caregivers in these family situations. And being the oldest child, I would have assumed that the oldest sibling would take on this care role and, and lead in that statistic, but I was wrong. And we'll talk a little bit more about why the youngest child may be the preferred caregiver here on this next slide. Slide. So on top of the findings we've already talked about, uh, sibling caregivers may need to deal with another factor. According to additional research by Cornell University gerontologist Carl Pilmer, he says favoritism is also alive and well. He conducted a study that found that mothers aged 65 to 75 in and around the Boston, Massachusetts area were perfectly willing to name a favorite among their children. And I know this is just one study, but this could be a factor. So the truth is birth order and parental preference do impact caregiver situations in families where there are multiple siblings. And these are important factors to keep in mind when you're working with families who are making decisions on behalf of their aging parent. Uh, so firstborns are said to be highly responsible and commanding leaders, while the youngest are more mild-mannered and easygoing, maybe even a little more humble. Uh, and so these types uh, of characteristics characteristics stick with them as they grow into adult caregivers. And the firstborns often feel it's their job to make decisions for the aging parent. Uh, and they also might expect their younger brothers and sisters to fall in line behind them. Um, and I know uh, being an oldest child, I find myself relating to this completely. I seem to be the mother hen when it comes to making sure our family gets together regularly, uh, making sure everyone's doing well and keeping in touch. And I think this will probably translate uh, into my caregiving for my parents as we age and my siblings. So, uh, but back to the research, Insta interesting, pardon me, in interestingly enough, um, many of the aging parents have a favorite child who he or she wants to be their primary caregiver. And they often kind of have this in mind years before they actually need care. And in two out of three cases, the favorite is the uh, obliging youngest child, not the older bossy child. So, um, and in a study conducted in 2010 uh, for the Omaha-based Homestead Senior Care, and there's also a joint study by Cornell and Purdue University 
uh, back in 2013, they found that parents uh, are more likely to become depressed when the presence of the primary caregiver is not honored. So here they have in their mind, oftentimes before they even need the care, that they want one of their children to be the primary caregiver. And if, if that doesn't pan out, sometimes it can cause depression and some conflict. So uh, what can families do in these situations? Let's look at that. Let's look at one solution here on the next slide. Home Instead Senior Care has partnered with sibling relationships expert Dr. Ingrid Condesis from the University of Western Ontario to develop the 50-50 rule program to help siblings deal with the many issues associated with caring for their aging parents. And the 50-50 rule refers to the average age of about 50 when siblings are typically caring for their parents as well as the need for brothers and sisters to equally share the caregiving plan the caregiving and the planning, 50-50. Uh, so if you're working with seniors with adult children around the age of 50, you're trying to figure out uh, how to share the care, um, it's time for them to develop a plan, and this 50-50 rule program can help. And I'll share the link with you uh, at the end of the webinar so you can direct people there. Um, but before we do that, let's talk about some more issues that can cause sibling conflict here on the next slide. Family caregiving can be stressful under any circumstance, but certain solutions are hot-button triggers. And you probably see these issues come up quite frequently in the families you work with. So let's run through them here. The first hot-button issue is illness. A parent who becomes ill or experiences declining health can leave a family facing all sorts of potentially difficult issues and uh, decisions. Uh, such as who will provide the, the additional care that's needed and how will the care be divided among the siblings. Um, and these brothers and sisters can have differing opinions on the types of care their parents should receive. Um, I bet a number of you have seen similar situations where uh, a parent's not thriving. Uh, they think a great plan of care might be hospice or palliative care. However, the other sibling's not ready to accept that mom or dad needs to take this next step. The other, but still the other child thinks it's the best option, so there's some tension there. Or maybe you've seen a situation where siblings are arguing whether or not assisted living or specialized Alzheimer's care is the right option. Um, so this is where it's hard because siblings turn to us as a professional to be the tiebreaker, so to speak, but we really do need to stay neutral and objective as professionals in the healthcare field or uh, the care field. Um, also, to further complicate the situation, many illnesses present changing needs, and siblings will need to be flexible to address these changing health issues. Um, another disagreement that can come up along the same lines is an elder's condition or capabilities. And it's common for family members to have very different ideas about what's wrong with a loved one and what should be done about it, or whether a loved one is capable or not capable of doing certain things. I recently worked with a family where there was a son living in California, and his, uh, he insisted that his father with Alzheimer's disease was capable of outings, and he wanted the caregiver to take his dad out to socialize, maybe have a meal out every now and then. But the daughter who lived in town and who actually lived with her father said that her dad gets easily confused and extremely anxious when he goes on outings. So the two had very significant differences in their perceptions of what was going on with their dad. And I'm sure you guys see this all the time. It's pretty common. Um, so the second hot button issue is money. And it's no surprise that money complicates life at any stage, let alone dealing with an aging parent or an ill parent. Uh, and siblings can be forced to make tough caregiving decisions when their loved one's finances factor into the equation. You know, one caregiver, or sorry, one sibling might be um, the healthcare power of attorney. The other might be the financial power of attorney. So there's some potential conflicts there. If the healthcare power of attorney thinks one type of care is best, but the financial power of attorney says, you know, hey, mom or dad can't afford that. So again, some conflicts can arise there. And then a third hot button issue, which kind of ties into the money factor, is inheritance. Um, and while some families contend with a lack of funds to provide care for their loved ones, 
others have the temptation of an inheritance influ influencing their decisions. And you might have seen this in some families you work with. Um, but if a sibling is coming from the wrong place or making decisions based on wanting their parents to save money or spend money, it can cause conflict. Uh, and siblings will need to recognize that it's in a highly emotional issue that can easily es escalate to a family feud, uh, especially when inheritance is involved. And, you know, when, when things escalate, everyone stands to lose. So involving an impartial financial planner might be the best solution where money is a significant tension point for a family. We also have to take into account that roles and rivalries dating back to childhood might rear their ugly head uh, in these caregiving situations. Mature adults also find, um, often find themselves in the sandbox when the family gets back together. So they might have a tendency um, to, to bicker, argue, or bring up things from the past. So um, when working with Families, you need to keep this in mind. And I know I worked with a, uh, a specific family who had two brothers, and they never got along, and they always communicated with me through their sister. I thought this was really strange. Um, but I learned later that one of the brothers was sent to live with his grandmother as a child, and the other one resented him to this day. So it's something I couldn't control. Uh, I just had to adapt. Uh, but, you know, there's never a dull moment in this line of work when we're working with families with complicated sibling relationships. Um, so moving on to our fourth hot button issue, and that's distance. And with such a global society, people are moving, siblings are moving away from each other. Um, they might, but those that live in the same town or city might also be stuck with some uh, lack of communication. Um, and those primary caregivers often are the ones that are in the same city as their loved one. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, 43% of families, one sibling is that responsible or is responsible for the bulk of the caregiving work for mom or dad. Um, and so oftentimes those long distance caregivers, they can feel left out, or if they do speak up, um, the primary caregiver, the local caregiver, might feel offended or might feel that they're meddling uh, in, in the primary caregiver's duties and responsibilities. So uh, again, the primary caregiver may feel that others are not helping and they're left with all the work. Um, that might be just kind of a factor of distance. So again, a hot button issue to consider there. And then the final hot button topic is stress. So daily life can be stressful enough, and a family care, being a family caregiver can make it more so. And adult caregivers, you know, if, if they work uh, a full-time job, maybe they're starting a new job, maybe they're raising their own children, that sandwich generation where they're raising their kids and caring for their aging loved one, you know, those types of situations can make caring for an, uh, an elderly family member or elderly loved one, um, can make them feel overwhelmed and stressed. And siblings who are bearing the brunt of the, the caregiving may resent their brothers or sisters who are unable or unwilling to help. And this, again, may cause more stress. Uh, and it might turn into the primary caregiver feeling like it's a burden to care for their loved ones. So we'll talk a little bit later about, uh, about this. Uh, but on the next side, slide, we're going to look at some additional underlying emotional areas that caregivers might feel. Another uh, issue that often comes up is control. So it's important to establish who is the boss. Uh, siblings should each have a role if they want one, but it's important to appoint a primary person or a coordinator. Maybe this is the power of attorney, the oldest child. Maybe one of the children is works in the healthcare field and they want to take the lead. Uh, so using words like coordinator rather than primary caregiver or person in control can foster an environment of collaboration among siblings. Um, and each sibling or person has their own strengths, so giving everyone a role is important and helps each person feel that they're a member of the care team. And we can encourage families to sit down together and make a strength-based plan uh, based on this each sibling's skills, abilities, and uh, time and resources. So I worked with a family that had multiple children who were spread out spread out around the U.S., and they seemed to divvy up their responsibilities pretty well. I was impressed. Uh, and they did so based on e each child's strengths. So one of the sons was a physician, so naturally he oversaw her med the mom's medical needs. Another son was a businessman, and he handled all the finances, making sure her bills were paid and that sort of thing. And then the daughter, she worked in the hospitality industry, and she was very social. 
So she made sure mom was always keeping in touch with family members through Facebook, Skype, email, regular phone calls and visits. And in a way, she was her, mom, her mom's event coordinator. So uh, giving each sibling roles based on their strengths can make it more uh, fun and interesting and makes it easier for them to contribute to the care of their loved one. The next uh, issue that might come up is underappreciation. Uh, that might be an emotion that caregivers will feel. There can be situations where, again, one sibling's doing all of the work, carrying the load for the entire family, and when this person's overworked and underappreciated, everyone will suffer. The caregiver themselves will feel tremendous stress and pressure, and when that person is stressed out, the rest of the family will feel it, including the care recipient, which is the last thing we want to happen in any caregiving situation. So it's important that we help this primary caregiver realize that they can't do it alone and they need to manage their stress. And as a professional, we can suggest that they call a family meeting and ask for more help from others. We, and we can encourage the family to come up with solutions. And this might also be a time when we can share the resources in our community to help the primary caregiver manage, manage the situation. And we can also give them tips on how to manage stress. And this can really go a long way for that primary caregiver. The last uh, issue that might come up is um, perfect, the perfectionist issue. Uh, we all know people that are perfectionists. They have the mentality, you know, if I want something done right, I should just do it myself. And we've probably come across the family caregiver that thinks no one can care for my mom or my dad the way I can. So I don't want to give up those roles and responsibilities. It needs to be done perfectly. You know, and our role as a professional, we can bring awareness to the fact that it's okay if the bed is not made right, or the dishes aren't put away exactly the way uh, you want them to. As, but it, the fact is, is it's getting done. Um, and so if we can, again, uh, distribute some of the duties uh, to multiple siblings, uh, it can ease the burden on that primary caregiver. And again, it might not be done perfect, but um, it, it'll get done in the end. So while the perfectionist personality is not everyone's, it might come up as a conflict in some family situations. So now that we've talked about all the issues, all the stats and uh, figures, let's talk about some solutions, and we'll do so here on the next slide. All right, so we will want to uh, help families realize that it's really important to identify and list the senior's needs in this specific situation. You know, there might be uh, medical issues, uh, maybe they are needing to go to some regular medical appointments, or maybe uh, they need medicine picked up at the pharmacy, that sort of thing. Uh, there's housing needs. Are they staying at home? Do they need to move to a facility? Maybe they'll move in with one of the siblings. Activities of daily living. You know, is mom dressing herself? Is she eating? Is she able to bathe on her own? Uh, is she able to get around efficiently, effectively, and safely? And then there's the end of life decisions maybe wills, advanced directives, long-term care types of decisions. Those are all things that need to be identified if it applies to the situation. Uh, food preparation and meals. How is mom getting her food? Uh, how many meals a day does she eat? Does she have specific dietary restrictions that we need to take into account? And then there's wherever they live, the housekeeping. You know, who's going to do the laundry? Um, does she need regular housekeeping? That sort of thing. Um, any other appointments in addition maybe to the doctor, eye doctor, um, podiatrist, those types of things. And then transportation. How will mom get around to those appointments, to social obligations, that sort of thing? How will the bills be paid? Maybe um, companionship is important to the loved one. So what kind of outings, what kind of activities does that senior loved one want to continue to engage in? So once you have all of these needs nailed down, next thing to do is research the options. So when siblings have identified the needs of the senior, they also need to identify the types of services um, that are available in the area if they are unable, unwilling um, to help the senior with that specific need. Um, and that's where us as professionals can come in and help them discover those resources in the community. And again, this could be done by holding a family meeting to discuss um, the options and then also discuss 
whose job it will be to handle and manage each of these areas of the senior's needs and how to divide up the tasks so that everyone has an input, everyone has a role, everyone has an opportunity to share their ideas. And planning ahead. You know, I, I always say it's better to plan ahead uh, than have having to make decisions in a crisis situation. So that's why these family meetings um, are so important uh, because when the needs are identified and when the resources are identified, siblings will have a better idea of what will be required from each family member. Um, so again, if a family member wants to stay home and age in place, can identify those needs, identify the resources that will help them do so. And then the siblings can also plan around who will uh, will provide the support to that parent in that capacity. So uh, a checklist is very helpful, but on the next slide we have some uh, additional general tips for, for siblings. Experts offer a number of recommendations about how to help siblings cope with the demands of family caregiving. So let's talk briefly about uh, avoiding family conflicts that can develop between siblings. The first thing for families to remember is the importance of talking and listening. I, I'm guilty of this. I need to even get better at this. But um, when adults and siblings get together, whether it's in person, by phone, Skype, uh, they really need to listen to each other's questions and concerns. Then they be, uh, once they do that, then they can begin to list all the resources that their families will need through this journey. And I talked earlier about how, it's, how important it is for brothers and sisters to stay in regular contact with one another. And again, this will avoid miscommunication and hurt feelings. Um, and sometimes listening, uh, even though sometimes we don't want to listen, we just want to do, um, can be really powerful and really impactful in, this, in these types of situations. Um, and it will pave the way to success. And especially those primary caregivers, you know, sometimes they just want to talk about the stress of the day or the frustrations they have about mom and dad and just need maybe a long distance sibling to listen um, and just acknowledge what they're going through. So again, uh, the listening uh, can be really, really impactful in these situations. Next, uh, encouraging siblings to make decisions together is really important. Um, if, if they can work together, uh, then it will be the key to family harmony. Seniors' needs may change as they age, uh, and so, so do the lives of these adult siblings. So starting off by making decisions together will help in the changing environment. And this kind of goes along with that next point of remaining flexible. So if, if the siblings are able to plan ahead but yet remain flexible, uh, it can be important and a big part of caregiver success. And as parents age, their need for assistance will most likely increase. So uh, families will need to adapt their plan of care on a regular basis. And that's, again, why those family meetings can be so important and crucial um, as, the, as the loved one age, ages. And finally, uh, divide the workload. All the caregiving tasks, uh, when they've been divided equally, um, it will, it will make the caregiving situation a lot better. So siblings should consider a division of labor that, again, that takes into account each family member's interests and skills, as well as their availability. And we talked earlier about this. Again, it can't be stressed enough. Families can promote sibling teamwork and decision making um, by setting up regular times to stay in touch. And, you know, there's, in today's world of technology, there's so many different options. They can, again, hold in-person family meetings. Maybe they have regular uh, phone calls, email updates. Maybe it's a group text. I know my family has a group text that we all update each other, send pictures, uh, words of encouragement and such. So families can set up these regular communication um, touch points. And then they can also uh, set up a time to regularly, regularly pardon me, re review the caregiver plan caregiving plan. And um, again, all these things will go a long way towards avoiding miscommunication and misunderstanding. And it's important that sibling, no one sibling is taking on too much of the work. If you remember back to one of our very first slides, um, only 2% of families are actually splitting up the caregiving duties effectively, um, and we want that number to grow. So uh, primary caregivers need to ask for help if they need it, and I know that can be really hard to do. Um, and sometimes, even if they do ask for it, they might do it in kind of a roundabout way. Uh, so these primary caregivers need to be very direct with their sibling. You know, um, on, on Wednesdays, 
you know, I want to go to my Bible study, so I need somebody in the family to come over and stay with mom. Or we need to set up care for mom on that evening because I just need to get away. Or I'm really overwhelmed with all of mom's bills. Can one of you please just take over uh, the bill paying, maybe do it online, that sort of thing. So if they're more direct about what they need and they ask for help, um, it can be much more effective. And it, it's a good way um, to get those long-distance caregivers involved. And uh, families shouldn't expect that primary caregiver to be the only one regularly updating the family. The long-distance caregivers and the other siblings need to be calling, checking in often, asking for uh, ways they can help the primary caregiver. And I can't say this enough. You might be sick of it by now, but communication is the key. So let's look at communication specifically here on this next slide. So ways we can communicate effectively. First off, spend time understanding the situation and do so from each person's perspective. We need to tell siblings that just because their perspectives are different, it doesn't mean that they're wrong. So when siblings take the time to learn each other's perspectives, things will run a lot smoother. We can encourage siblings to spend time with the care recipient and talk to them in person. Spend time with mom or dad and see what their uh, activities of daily living are like, see what their daily routine is like. That might help them get a better understanding of what's really going on. And it's important for families to see with their own eyes what is happening. And maybe even visit uh, with their doctor or other healthcare professionals. And the key is not to jump to, con jump to conclusion, but just to seek understanding in, in these complicated situations. And it's best to over-communicate. Um, I can relate to this with one family that I worked with, um, a lack of a lack of communication was there. Um, at this time, my, my client was receiving assistance only in the morning. She uh, just needed help getting up and ready for her day, but she came down with the flu and became a lot weaker. And her daughter, who was the healthcare power of attorney, decided she needed some extra assistance in the evening getting ready for bed just because she was so weak. Um, and when the brother, who was the financial power of attorney, received the bill, he was upset because his sister didn't inform him of the increase in care and increase in expense. And this conflict could have been avoided with a simple phone call or email exchange between the siblings. So making sure siblings are communicating is key, and over-communication is especially good um, with long-distance caregivers. And it, again, it's not just the primary caregiver's job to send out information because they're busy caring for mom and dad, mom or dad. Um, the siblings should also call in and check in regularly. And it's important to be empathetic when it comes to the caregiving situation. As siblings interact, uh, they need to try to put themselves in the different roles and under, understand the different perspectives that are going on. And um, in any communication setting, body language can have a big impact uh, on the situation. So if a person is relaxed and calm, it'll show on their face and their posture and their tone of voice. Um, and again, it just can avoid any conflict, any uh, misunderstanding of anger or resent resentment. And then finally, just be honest. Uh, and this goes back to the primary caregiver. Is the workload too much? If so, they have to communicate and get help. Uh, and they need to uh, be sure that they take a look at their caregiving responsibilities and consider, uh, what do I really need help with before I ask for it? Uh, what do I want my siblings to take on? Which tasks? Uh, and how can we help give that primary caregiver a break? Or what kinds of things can I get out and do uh, to relieve some stress? Or if you feel like you have the care under control and you don't need um, more physical assistance, maybe you need more financial support or emotional support. So if you're honest with yourself and about your needs as a caregiver, then you can be honest with what you need from your siblings. So it's important to be honest and realistic about what you can and can't provide. You know, maybe um, in these situations, if the caregiver is feeling overwhelmed, you know, okay, my mom and my sister don't really get along, so having her come over here and relieve me of my caregiving duty might not be the best, but I could ask her to maybe go out and grab the groceries that I was planning on getting later today that I just don't have time for now, or maybe she can help me pay the bills. Um, or maybe I know my brother can't help pay for some of the extra services, but he has a lot of free time because he's retired, uh, and he can help with some housework, or he can come over and watch mom or dad while I go out and um, get some much needed time away, time for myself. So I know the families that you work with um, 
have difficulty with communication and decision making, and it's sometimes it might be best if things escalate and get really complicated to bring in a mediator or a professional outside of the family. And for some of you on your on this webinar, you might be one of those mediators that families bring in. I know I have had to be the mediator a few times, uh, but some other examples might be a financial advisor, especially in those cases where uh, finances are an issue. Uh, legal counsel might be a good option. Consulting a physician, a social worker, or a care manager might be good. So. Uh, and again, it's important for the mediator to stay neutral and consider what's in the best interest of the aging parent. Because at the end of the day, uh, we all want the best for that aging parent. So those are definitely important factors to take into account. So on this next slide, we'll look at what resources are available. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, so at the core of the 50-50 rule, which we talked about earlier, is family relationships and communicating. So there's a guide and a website, solvingfamilyconflict.com, and both feature practical advice and a wealth of real-life scenarios with ex expert responses um, on the site. And there's also the checklist that we've talked about, in addition to other wonderful information and resources. So certainly worth checking out, not only as a professional, but also to direct families to that site. There are also organizations and resources available to help family caregivers learn about their options in terms of caring for their loved one. And you can encourage family members to do their research and reach out to resources so that everyone has the opportunity to learn and share ideas. Family members can start by checking out websites such as eldercare.gov, and caring.com. Those are two great resources that I've used regularly. Resources in the senior community such as area agencies, sorry, area agencies on aging, triple A's, um, can also be a great resource. My community has a wonderful uh, agency on aging. Uh, the senior's doctor or geriatric care manager may also be of assistance and be able to provide resources for you as a professional and for uh, the uh, senior loved one's family. So those are some, some resources that can help out. And I know, again, taking care of a family, or families taking care of a loved one as they age can be tough, and the stakes are high. Sibling relationships and the quality of the senior's care is always at risk, but with new approaches and a focus on building better family relationships and caregiving can make families stronger than ever, and that's our goal. So uh, let's wrap up here on the next I hope that you found today's presentation both helpful and encouraging. We've gone over a lot today, and um, I know many of you are working with clients and their families that are faced with some of the challenges that we've covered in the webinar. So please take a moment to think about the next steps for you. I've listened, listed some questions here that may help you take those next steps. Uh, so how will you, what hot button issues? Um, are happening in your family situations, and how can you incorporate uh, the information presented to you today into your arsenal of resources? Uh, what are some things that you can do to help family caregivers minif minimize sibling conflict when caring for their parent? And then what resources are available to help ease the stress between siblings? So thank you so much for joining me on the webinar today. And I personally want to thank all of you for the work that you do helping seniors and their families. It's not an easy job. Um, it definitely takes special people to do it, and you are all very special. So thank you for what you do. You're doing a great job, and know that you are truly appreciated. So with that, I will open it up for any questions. I believe you can type them in the box. Is that right, Steve? Yes, that's right. Thank you, Lakeland. Very uh, great presentation. Thank you so much for sharing, presenting with us here today. We also want to welcome Erin Albers to the line from Home Instead Senior Care. Welcome, Erin. Thanks, Steve. So Erin's going to be joining us for the Q&A portion here. And as you can see from the slide up on your screen, it's time for that portion of today's webinar. OK, Lakeland, uh, first question here for you. Do you have any additional tips for dealing with a brother-in-law or sister-in-law wanting their own wishes inserted into the caregiving situation? That's a good question. That can be tricky. You know, every family situation is different. Um, I mean, Erin, do you have any, do we have any specific resources on this 
this topic? You know, I would just say, you know, hear them out. What are their suggestions? Really look at everybody in the family and what they want to bring to the table. I mean, they're affected by it, too, even though they're in-laws of some sort. So I think it's important that they, they have a voice, because even if it's them who are affected by it through a spouse, I think just making sure that they feel heard and maybe have a portion of the care if they feel really strong about something one way or another, I do think that um, they just need to be heard and a part of the process, even though they're not blood of the, the senior, they're still affected by it. All right, um, next question here. I work in an industry and I have a parent with dementia who refuses any in-home assistance. I have tried the local elder care center psychologists, et cetera, but no one can convince my parent to accept assistance. What should I do in this situation? I see that come up every now and then, and mm -hmm. it is a difficult situation. Um, and it, that, that question is a little difficult because it also kind of depends on how far along they are in the diagnosis of Alzheimer's or dementia. If it gets to a point where um, maybe the family could, instead of calling them a, a caregiver or a healthcare professional is going to come in and help you, maybe approaching it from the perspective of, um, oh, my friend my friend Susie is going to come over to your house today and she's just going to hang out with you and uh, spend some time with you. And then while that person is there, maybe they are a professional caregiver, uh, uh, they could refer to themselves as a friend. Oh, I'm a friend of your daughter's or a friend of your neighbor's and I'm just here to stop in and see how you're doing and maybe make it more of a companionship friendship at first that could involve, evolve into more of an assistant situation or um, if the senior loved one lays down for a nap then they could do some tasks around the house or if they go to the bathroom or take a shower, do some tasks around the house and kind of do it incognito. Um, but sometimes you have to get a little creative in those situations where they're really resistant. Erin, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think that's, that's good. Or a lot of times I know another approach might be to be like, Mom or Dad, I know you don't need this, but we have the worries, so will you do it for us? Almost put it on like, we know you don't need this, but it's something that would make us sleep better because every parent, no matter what, knows or doesn't want their kid to, to experience or be put out. So um, sometimes it works to use the route of, we know you're fine, but do it for us approach. Mm -hmm. That's a great tip. Okay, um, do you have any insight or tips or suggestions for dealing with difficult family members who are not willing or able to work as part of the team? That's, again, a challenging situation. So uh, if, if uh, a loved one is not willing or able, um, I know earlier I, I kind of gave some examples, you know, if they're not financially able, then maybe they could do something more hands-on, or if they aren't Maybe they are limited by a physical disability. They can't contribute physically. Maybe they can contribute in other ways, making phone calls. Now, if they're really resistant and uh, unwilling to participate at all, um, I think it goes back to um, making sure that the primary caregiver expresses the need in the caregiving situation uh, and why that need is important and how that um, need contributes to the well-being of their senior loved one. And by hopefully effectively communicating that, it would ho hopefully change their mind and help them to contribute. But um, if you're able to find ways that they can contribute based on their strength or, you know, say, hey, Joe, you're really, Brother Joe, you're really good with your finances. Could you please help mom out with, with hers? Or, uh, again, again, just playing to their strengths. You might have to butter them up a little bit. Uh, but it could help to convince them. Anything else, Erin? No, I think that's good. Okay, um, you were talking earlier, a little bit earlier, about um, uh, mediators to help in with uh, conflict situations. So the question mm -hmm. is, do you have any insight about good resources to help locate mediators or conflict resolution specialists who deal with these specific types of issues? I think, um, well, at least in, in my community, um, reaching out to the Area Agency on Aging, mm -hmm. they can provide uh, a lot of good local resources. Um, you know, a, a geriatric care manager, uh, more and more you're seeing people who have their own 
practice of uh, helping to coordinate and um, find, help families find the best care for their loved one and help navigate that complicated uh, senior care continuum. So those types of people might also be a good resource. Um, but I would, again, that area agency on aging will probably be a, a good place to start, I would imagine. Or the, uh, the physician social work setting might also have some options. All right, uh, next question here. Do you know of any resources out there for how to get families involved who are frustrated with their parents' behaviors and no longer want to be involved in a senior's care? Mm. Yeah, that can, be, that can be very challenging when uh, the senior is um, refusing the care or has become really difficult, and um, it can make caring for them unpleasant. And um, I think as far as resources go, if it gets to a point where the loved one is no longer safe in their own environment or the caregiver is unsafe in the environment, then it might be a good option to bring in outside care if it's available. Um, sometimes just having uh, a new person that's not related can make a, a big impact. It can also give the, caregiver, the family caregiver time away from their loved one, time to refresh, reboot, um, because we know caring for people is, is um, emotionally draining, physically draining, so if they can have that time to recharge, it might be easier to get back in there and kind of face um, that challenging situation again. But I would say uh, trying to bring in a, th a third party to provide care might um, ease some of that tension. Okay, and uh, we've had a couple people who have uh, sent in some uh, great resources for us, so I just want to share those oh, really wonderful. quickly here. So. Um, it's always a great part. Um, thank you for sending those in, everybody. If you have any tips, we do like to pass those on. So first one here, um, another good resource for caregivers is the Family Caregiver Alliance slash the National Center on Caregiving. And you can check them out at caregiver.org. Again, that's the Family Caregiving Alliance and the National Center on Caregiving at www.caregiver.org. So I just wanted to pass on a note about that. We also had uh, someone write in, um, if you are dealing in situations with dementia, the Alzheimer's Association is a very good resource. So I want to thank the yes. folks who sent in those tips for us. Um, very appreciated. Yeah, All right. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. And, and we love to pass those things on. Um, it's, it's a sharing environment here. If you have any tips like that, please send them in. Um, we do love to pass those on to everybody else who is listening. Um, back to the questions here. Lakeland and Aaron. Uh, next question, how would you suggest four siblings that disagree with end-of-life care for a parent, how would you deal with a situation like that? that so four, four <sighs> siblings dealing with an end-of-life situation, and they all have differing opinions, that, that is tough. Um, if the senior is still able to contribute to the decision-making, I think that would be the best place to start. Um, I'm not sure what the situation is specifically, but, um, and I, again, that goes back to the fact uh, that planning in those family meetings sooner rather than later is so important because you can help the family members make those decisions while the, while the, the loved one, the aging parent, is able to contribute. So I would say if the aging parent is still alive or the loved one is still alive, consulting them first to see what their wishes are. Um, I think that is most important because then those wishes uh, kind of trump everyone else's uh, in terms of the care because really at the end of the day it's all about that senior loved one. Now if they are uh, not in a capacity to contribute, um, I think again it's important that all family members are heard. Um, they're able to all express their uh, opinions and their wishes. Uh, and hopefully come to a consensus. Maybe the financial situation will help make some of those decisions. Maybe the geographical decisions will help make uh, that a little easier. Um, but it is, it is very difficult uh, when, again, siblings aren't getting along. But if they're able to uh, communicate, listen to one another, uh, and hopefully they can find some uh, common ground. Okay, and we've had a, a couple more people shoot us some great resources here, so I'm going to just uh, share those real quick as well. Um, another great resource is the Area Agency on Aging for assessing the person assisting 
and accessing resources. Uh, you, you were both talking about the area agencies on agency, agencies on aging earlier, so we want to pass on a note about them. Um, we had someone else uh, let us know, aginglifecare.org is a website to find a geriatric care manager through the National Association of Geriatric Care Managers, and you can go on there and search for a local care manager in your area. Again, that website is aginglifecare.org if you want to uh, search for a geriatric care manager in your area. Um, and third person, third person here, thank you for sending this in. Uh, how about the 211 for county resources? Now, I don't know. I haven't actually heard of 211, but um, have you, Lakeland or Aaron, have you heard about the 211? Is that a? Have I have not. That? Okay. I have not either. I'm going to look into that. <laughs> All right. Um, so thanks, everybody, for sending in those great tips and resources. Um, okay, next question. Let's get back to the questions here. How do you handle issues between brother and sister when dealing with elderly parents when the sister is the one living in the house with the parents? So in other words, mm -hmm. when there's one uh, sibling who is actually physically closer to them and the conflicts that can arrive from that. That can be hard because sometimes if, if they're living with the senior loved one, it feels like they can never really get away from the situation and they can't reboot. Um, but I, I, again, I think it's important to look at um, the strengths of each brother and sister and see, you know, what are they really each really good at, and maybe they can divide up the caregiving responsibility in that in that regard. Um, also, um, making sure that the brother, if he if he has the time in his schedule, and if he lives close enough, uh, comes in to provide respite for that sister, making sure she has an opportunity to get away, even if it's just to the basement to read a book or take a nap. Um, just that little time away can help her recharge, reboot, um, and also help the brother feel like he's contributing. So hopefully those are some tips that, 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 fam that would help that family. Um, but it, Living with an aging parent is difficult, and we do have a resource. Erin, what's the name of that? I can't think of it. Too Close for Comfort? Is that the name? Yes. That yep, exactly. Resource? Too Close for Comfort .com. And that, that website is all about uh, when an aging parent lives with their adult child. So that would be a great website to direct that family towards. Lots of resources and tools on that site. Or if you go to caregiverstress.com, and uh, search too close for comfort, that's probably better because it'll give you more resources. Caregiverstress.com okay, is just an excellent resource for all of these questions. I agree. Excellent. And uh, yes, here's a perfect example of, of indicative of what I was talking about earlier. I've had several people write in and clarify for us about the 211. Um, so, uh, just want to give some information about that. Um, some folks have let us know that it's, it's run by the United Way. Other uh, areas, it's run out of their library, the local library. Um, 211 is an easy-to-remember three-digit telephone number, which has been assigned by the FCC for the purpose of providing quick and easy access to information about health and human services. It's available depending on the area of the residence. Um, we've had folks from California and Texas write in and say they have it there. The website is also 211.org. It helps people people find local resources. The website is available 24-7. So uh, that's excellent. Thank you, everybody, for writing in and let us, letting us know a little bit more about 211. And apparently it's in Alaska and Colorado, too. So we've got at least four uh, or five out of the 50 mm -hmm. states covered there, too. And Ohio, South Dakota. Well, look at this, an unbelievable amount of, of sharing of information going on. Thank you very much, Michigan, Illinois, Mil Missouri, Alabama, Tennessee. Um, who don't we have on the call here? Kansas, oh my, this is, it's incredible. I guess it sounds like it's in every state, Nebraska, South Carolina. This is really cool. Thanks, for everybody, for letting us know more about 211. I've certainly learned a little bit about that here today. So thank you, everybody, for letting us know more about that. Um, okay, back to the questions here. Um, do you have any uh, resources or sources on uh, for perhaps pamphlets or written material um, to give uh, individuals and families a little bit more objective information as opposed to a caregiver or a caseworker just verbally saying it to them? In other words, an access to a little bit more objective, such as printed material websites or anything like that. Do you have any suggestions 
on things like that. Can you repeat that, Steve, exactly? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, they're looking understand. for resources on uh, printed material or websites that are more objective to talk about family uh, conflict issues as opposed to a caseworker or a caregiver just verbally telling them that, where that might be misconstrued as a personal opinion, for example. Um, looking for more oh. like objective written materials, online materials, things like that. Right. I would, again, go to caregiverstress.com while we run that site. It's actually um, all of the materials and information on there are gathered from a series of experts. So you can go out on that site. You can also chat with someone um, that can align you with an expert. So I would definitely check out caregiverstress.com. And there are things on that site as well that you can download and print off to share with family or email. There's newsletters you can receive on a regular basis. Okay, and another tip on information, check university extension services in your state for materials. I know Ohio has good materials. Um, uh, back to the questions here, um, Aaron and Lakeland, exactly how common are these, uh, you know, conflict issues with, uh, with families? You've been working in the field for quite some time. Is it, you know, is it, is it extremely prevalent and, and what do we do? Like when I, I've worked, I've worked in the field several several years, and uh, work with families specifically helping to manage their care before I came to this role, and um, and I would say at least in half of the families, um, it is common. You know, it, and it might not be um, to it might it might be kind of minor in some situations and in others it's much more prevalent so again it's very situational but in at least half of the families that i work with at least one of these conflicts or issues that i've mentioned come up at some point in the caregiving process you know it might not be there you know the the whole way through hopefully uh, I've helped the families in, in a lot of these situations work through those issues, but it is it is more common than you would think. So um, being prepared on how to help families deal with these conflicts and being aware of them first and foremost is uh, is important and can help you uh, in assisting these families along their caregiving journey. Well, and just the fact that according to our research, the fact that 43% of those families, that one person's responsible for, for providing it, that's going to cause tension right then and there. And I know in conversations I've had specifically with social workers that the hardest part of their job at times is that family dynamic that they're, they're having to deal with. So, um, yeah, I think unfortunately it can get um, pretty dirty sometimes, but then I think there's always just uh, – um, discomfort in the whole thing, uh, just in general. Okay, and uh, I had a lot of folks write in regarding the 211 issue. I rattled off probably 15 or 20 states, and I had probably 15 or 20 more come in after that. So it is, it is nationwide, so we did want to let you know about that. And that uh, everybody writing in from Tennessee and Kansas and South Carolina, Alaska, Wisconsin, etc., just shows the reach and the breadth of everybody that's been joining us today from all over the country. So we want to thank you for joining us today. And Aaron and Lakeland, I want to thank you for joining us and presenting today. Unfortunately, we're out of time. We've reached the end, of, the end of our hour here, and it's time for us to wrap up. But I want to thank you for an excellent presentation, and thank you for being here today. Yeah, thank you, Steve, and thanks for everyone else. Please join us each month.